Did depression exist in the time of the Prophet ﷺ? Was it recognized? Yes, it was. Was something done about it? Was it acknowledged? Was it addressed? Yes, it was. We're not taught Islamically that you have to bottle everything up and you don't seek help. Sometimes you can't do everything by yourself. You need help. There will be certain people who will come on the Day of Judgment because all the hardships that they went through and the difficulties, they will enter Jannah. And then when they enter Jannah, they'll be asked, did you see any difficulty in this world? And they'll say, we never saw any difficulty. It'll be forgotten completely because of the bliss of Jannah. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكًا As for the one who turns away from my religion, my remembrance, my guidance, he shall have a difficult, miserable, depressed life. Ik raad jou de podcast game Huwelijks Editie aan. Het is een prachtig spel en een manier om de communicatie in het huwelijk te verbeteren, om de banden te versterken, om de liefde en de genegenheid en de genade in het huwelijk een nieuw leven in te blazen. Het is sowieso leuker en leerzamer dan Netflix. Dus ik raad jullie allemaal aan om dit spel aan te schaffen en mogen Allah Azza wa Jal en ieder voorzien van een prachtig en gelukkig huwelijk. Amin. Ik raad jou de podcast game Gezinseditie aan te schaffen, waarin je leert te communiceren met je kinderen. Je komt als heel gezin bij elkaar en jullie gaan elkaar vragen stellen. Jullie leren elkaar beter kennen en jullie leren Allah samen beter kennen. Dus ik raad iedereen aan om dit spel aan te schaffen, om inshallah je kinderen, jezelf en je gezin op de juiste manier op te voeden bij Allah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum my dear brothers and sisters Welcome to a new podcast from Minute for Allah And today we are having a new guest He's called Ustad Yahya Rabi Assalamu alaikum Ustad, how are you doing? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Assalamu alhamdulillah, I'm very well And it's a pleasure to be here Thank you, it's an honor that you, are, that, you, that you came here to the Netherlands And uh, is this your first time? This is not my first time, alhamdulillah I've been in the Netherlands now three times I've, Three times? Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah And it's always enjoyable and great to be here Jazakum nice. khair um, we're going to discuss a topic it's, uh, It doesn't have any positive uh, term it's, it, it, has, it doesn't have any positive aspects to it Right. Uh, so it's another podcast example for about Jannah or something Whether it's a podcast about depression Inshallah, something that by is, the end of it we'll get to Jannah Inshallah, <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> And uh, before we're going to talk about depression First of all I want to acknowledge something first Is that uh, we acknowledge that there are psychological and medical disorders that people have. So mm -hmm. uh, today we're going to discuss ex exceptionally about having a depression that is linked to not having Iman, not having faith. So we're going to link it to the religion, inshallah. So the first question I'm having for you today, inshallah, is is depression a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it a punishment? How should I view it? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, thanaulillah, salatu salam ala rasulillah That's a very interesting question Because there's not one answer There will be numerous answers um, Depression doesn't necessarily mean That you are being punished by Allah ta'ala It could be a test from Allah ta'ala It could be a means for you to be raised in the hereafter Rif ali darajat Because the Prophet alayhi salatu salam He tells us in the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu That the believer is not afflicted with any harm or any fatigue or any illness or any sadness or grief or even the thorn that pricks him except that Allah Taala is expiating his sin through that. SubhanAllah. So any difficulty that the believer is afflicted with, it's a means for him to be forgiven and for him to be raised in the hereafter. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he mentions that the believer, he is... Yani he goes through these uh, difficulties and these hardships and these obstacles in this life so that Allah can protect him from the ultimate punishment in the hereafter, from the punishment of the hellfire. Right? So it's a means for you to face these difficulties here so that you go to Jannah in the end and that you do not end up in the hellfire. And that's what Allah he mentions in the Quran. Allah says in Surah Sajda, that certainly we are going to make them taste the smaller punishment, i.e. difficulties and hardships and, and tests and trials in this world. Instead of the greater punishment, i.e. the hellfire, why? 
لعلهم يرجعون so that they turn back to Allah عز وجل and they seek forgiveness from Allah تبارك وتعالى sometimes these difficulties and these tests that we go through in this life they are meant to serve as a wake up call what do we mean by that that for instance I become very distant from Allah and then everything was going very well in my life all of a sudden something went wrong it's meant to make me wake up so that I turn to Allah Azza wa Jal. I seek forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal for the sins perhaps that I committed and the shortcomings that I have and so on. So this is a blessing in disguise really because Allah wa Ta'ala, He doesn't want you to end up in the hellfire. So He gives you that wake up call in this world so that you do something about your shortcomings and your sins to protect you from that greater punishment. It's in the rahmah of Allah wa Ta'ala. And that's what the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, he says to us in a hadith that there will be certain people who will come on the day of judgment because all the hardships that they went through and the difficulties, they will enter Jannah. And then when they enter Jannah, they'll be asked, did you see any difficulty in this world? And they'll say, we never saw any difficulty it will be forgotten completely because of the bliss of Jannah. It, they, they are going to think and say that it was all worth it Because it got us here in the end They're going to say Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anna alhazan Inna rabbana laghafurun shakur They say Alhamdulillah As Allah says in Surah Fatir All praise due to Allah That got rid of alhazan Alhazan is extreme grief or depression They describe the worldly life as a depressing life then they say, Inna Rabbana la ghafurun shakur. Really, our Lord, our Lord Allah, Jalla fi ula, He is ghafurun, the one who constantly forgives, extremely forgiving, shakur, the appreciative one. Alladhi ahallana dar al muqamati min fadli, la yamasuna fiha nasabun, la yamasuna fiha lub. They say, the one who granted us this home in Jannah. And we're not going to face any illness, no fatigue, no tiredness, none of that in the Jannah. It's all goodness and bliss. So there's not one answer to it. It could be a punishment. It could be a test. It could be any of those. It could be a blessing in disguise that Allah wa is blessing you with in order to forgive and expiate all your sins. And Allah wa He tests those that He loves the most. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلْ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلْ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلْ He said, the people who are tested the most, who have the severest trials and tests in this world, are the Prophets and the Messengers. They went through the most difficult tests. And then those who follow them in faith, and those who follow them in faith, and those who follow them in faith, meaning those who have a strong faith after them, they are tested severely. As Allah says in Surah Al-Ankabut, he starts, أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فليعلمن الله الذين صدقوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَا سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ لَآتِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah says, do the people think that they can say, آمَنَّا, we believe, that we have faith, وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ and they shall not be tested. With the iman comes tests. It's part of the iman. Then Allah says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Certainly we have tested those who came before them. Why? What's the objective? فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا So that Allah can know those who are truthful, who are sincere in their faith. وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ So that Allah can know those who are not sincere, those who are not truthful. Because the test distinguish between the truthful and those who are not truthful. Right, 
And then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala towards the end of the ayah, Allah says, وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌ عَلَمِينَ That those who strive and they struggle for the sake of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, they're doing it for, this, for themselves because you're the one who's getting the reward in the end. You're not benefiting Allah in any way. And then towards the end of the surah, at the end of the surah, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, he says, and this is where he gives you glad tidings, that this jihad, the struggle that you're doing, this that you're striving, that you are putting so much effort Allah Tabarakata tells you it's not going to go wasted. Rather, he says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Those who strive and struggle for our sake, for the sake of Allah, sincerely for Allah. What does Allah say he's going to do for them? Allah says, لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا we shall guide them to our paths. What are those paths? The paths of sincerity, the paths of righteousness. Allah will open doors for you. Allah says, لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ In Arabic, the lamb here is for emphasis, tawqeed. And then the noon, it's two noons for tawqeed. It's extra emphasis. Allah is emphasizing three times here that we are definitely 100% going to guide them to our paths. And then Allah gives you another promise. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And verily, here emphasis, Allah is with those, لا emphasis, with those who do good. Allah will be with you, Allah will assist you, Allah will guide you, Allah will protect you, Allah will continue to bless you, Allah will keep you content, Allah will be pleased with you and please you. Why? By you striving for the, for the sake of Allah, taking a step towards Allah, showing Allah that you are trying your best to do that which pleases Allah. Allah, when you do minimum, He gives you a lot a lot more in return. Allah, you go to Him one hand span, Allah comes to you in arm span, you come to Allah walking, Allah comes to you rocking, running, as we have in the hadith of the Prophet. So that's the answer in a nutshell uh, I, 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 probably a nutshell, mentioned, I probably mentioned a lot <laughs> of things yani. yeah, 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 shukra yeah. I think, I think um, if we look at depression The first thing that comes to mention Is that if you could avoid it That would be better Of course So a question to you, for example, is uh, We spoke today about the use of social media yep. Has social media anything to do with depression? I believe, I believe that 100% social media has a lot to do with depression because what causes that grief and that extreme depression perhaps, it is people looking at or seeing what other people have and comparing their lives to other people's lives. And when they see that this person perhaps they look extremely happy, they have so much and they have all these blessings and I do not possess that. What tends to happen is a person might be Afflicted with uh, some sort of depression perhaps And um, what people do not realise is that What's on social media is just a percentage of people's lives And a lot of it is not real And Allah Taala, He tells us in the Quran And also the Prophet ﷺ reiterates in his sunnah That the individual should not look at those who have more than him Rather one should be content with what he has And he should look at those who have less than him So that he's grateful for what he possesses and what he has because we have so much. We have been blessed abundantly by Allah Ta'ala. If we were just to sit down and to think about the amount of blessings that Allah Ta'ala has bestowed upon us, we would, we would not be able to count them all. We would probably die before we even counted them all, right? So when an individual, he really reflects on his blessing. I'm just taking a breath. Ah, that breath that they've taken in. That was for free. Imagine I had to pay for that. <laughs> Imagine I had to pay for the oxygen just like I pay for the electricity Insurance. and I yeah. pay for the the, the energy bills and your phone. Imagine I had to pay a monthly bill for the oxygen that I'm breathing. Some of us will probably die. We wouldn't be able to afford it. Yeah. But then look at this. I don't even think about inhaling and exhaling. Imagine you had to think about inhaling and exhaling. I would forget to inhale. I'll probably suffocate, right? Yeah. But Allah automatically you are inhaling, exhaling without thinking about it. You're sleeping, you're inhaling, exhaling, right? These are from blessings that perhaps we take for granted. There was a man, old man, Arab man. He was asked, how are you? He was a man who had very little. He didn't have much. And when they asked him, how are you? He responded by saying, Alhamdulillah, 
انا بخير ما دام الهواء ببلاش هي سيد اي ام فاين از لونج از ذا اوكسجين از فري That's an individual who appreciates every blessing that Allah has granted them. When the individual is content and they have that rida with even the little that Allah has granted them, they have qana'a, they have that content and they are يعني, happy with what Allah has granted them, that is what protects you from falling into that sadness or that uh, depression, if you call it, uh, which causes the causes individual to يعني, perhaps go very far يعني, in, that, in that sadness. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala in the Quran, He tells us that what actually gives you that contentment that you're looking for is not through worldly matters. Worldly matters that we are so attached to and that we're constantly looking at, that's not where happiness lies. Like the poet will say, he'll say, وَلَسْتُ أَرَى السَّعَادَةَ جَمْعَ مَالٍ وَلَكِنَّ التَّقِيَّهُ وَالسَّعِيدُ فتقوى الله خير الزاد ذخرا فعند الله للأتقياء مزيد He says that I do not see that happiness and contentment is in accumulating wealth. That's not true. But the true content and happy one is the one who has got consciousness taqwa. And then he says that Allah جل في علاه He has prepared for those who have got consciousness and that taqwa A great reward and hereafter is saved for them. Could you could you explain taqwa? What taqwa is for the for the viewers? Amazing, taqwa. The components of taqwa they come back to these ex- exact matter that we're talking about. One of the perhaps best definitions of taqwa is the definition that Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu arda he gave us. He said that taqwa it is al-khawfu min al-jalil to fear Allah, to be one who fears Allah. He's fearful of doing that which angers Allah. He's fearful of doing anything that displeases Allah. He's afraid of committing sins. That fear, they're conscious that Allah Jalla fi ula, sees everything that they do and knows everything that they do. Therefore, they are fearful of Allah Jalla fi ula. Wal-amalu bit-tanzeel. And to act in accordance to revelation. The Quran, the Sunnah, you live by it. It governs your life. It's your methodology of life. Every aspect of your life, you go back to, what does the Quran say? What does the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, say? No, I just do it and after I do it, I ask, oh, was this correct or not? Like some people do. Rather, you make sure you're doing correctly in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, it shows a taqwa, right? It shows that you have that good consciousness in your heart. You want to do it in a way that's pleasing to Allah. And then he says, وَالْرِضَى بِالْقَلِيلِ And to be content with little. The little that Allah has given you, you have qana'ah, you have that contentment, you're happy. And then he says, وَالْإِسْتِعْدَادُ لِيَوْمِ الرَّحِيلِ And to prepare for your departure, your death. When you're going to leave this world, every single one of us is certain that we're going to leave this world, preparing for that. That is taqwa, he says. And some of the ulama, they define taqwa as it's taqwa, it's fear in the heart, which creates a barrier between you and that which angers Allah, the disobedience of Allah. Um, so that's taqwa in a nutshell. These people have that taqwa, they are the ones who are content. Because Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاتًا طَيِّبًا Whoever does righteous deeds, male or female, whilst they are a believer, we are going to grant them a good life. Iman and Amar Salih, which are the fruits of taqwa. That is the way to having a happy, content life, even if you have nothing. Even if you have nothing. There are many people, early on um, this in Ramadan, I went to go visit um, one of the countries in the Middle East and went to go visit some of the camps where there were refugees. And subhanAllah, we gave out you know, some parcels and to the families for iftar because they have nothing. You know, They left their countries, they left their homes. Um, they've started a complete uh, new life. Some of them are widows. They have, oh, have I, we went visit a family that there was a mother with twelve children. Most of them are under the age of puberty, and they have no father. No one's providing for them. Nothing. We gave them that food parcel, that food that they are in desperate need of. And imagine there's about fifteen of us, and that family is saying to us, "Have iftar with us." There's twelve of them, and they're insisting you have iftar with them. Why? I and mean, they have nothing, but they're content with what they have. Right? They're not complaining. They're happy because of Iman. 
that iman that you know that Allah Taala this life is temporary and that's going to come to an end and that you're going to be granted something better in the hereafter and that's what's worth wor- working for and striving for it makes you think that this whole world it's nothing in, in the sight of Allah Taala as hadith says it's like the the wing of a mosquito right no value at all insignificant so yeah yeah, if you if you look, for example, especially in the West, you see that depression increases a lot. You see a lot of uh, social media trends about, for example, a guy gets heartbroken, he goes to the gym. The gym has to be like a way out of his depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, uh, there, are, there are different, different solutions. They call it solutions in brackets. Uh, but the best solution is to have Iman. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's as you as you mentioned. Uh, my question is regarding depression. If now, for example, somebody is going to watch this podcast and is going to see, okay, this new information for me. But if you are already in a, the, you are already depressed. What should that person do to get out of that depression? Mm. It's a very good question. You know, the Prophet Ali Sallam, he went through a stage in his life where he was feeling extreme grief, real extreme grief. Because depression is a form of grief and sadness, right? He went through a stage where his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha passes away. And his uncle Abu Talib passes away. His two main supporters die in a short period after one after the other. So the Prophet والسلام, you can imagine, he was extremely sad, feeling extreme grief. Shortly after that incident of his wife and his uncle passing away, what happened to the Prophet ﷺ? The Prophet ﷺ was taken from Mecca And then he went to Jerusalem On the night of Al-Salaam Al-Miraj He went to Bayt Al-Maqdis And then he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taken To the heavens He went to the first heavens Up to the highest level Until Sidrat Al-Muntaha And he went to Allah Taala, And he spoke to Allah directly Behind the veil And Allah Taala Gave him the gift of Salah Now one may ask All the other acts of worship Zakah, Suyam, Hajj You know all these acts of worship They were obliged on earth The Prophet ﷺ was on earth And through Jibreel ﷺ He was given these acts of worship Why is it that the Salah The Prophet ﷺ was taken from Mecca To Jerusalem, to the heavens To be given the gift of Salah It's a question that one may ask Allah Azza wa Jalla said to Jibreel To give him Salah The answer to that As Ibn Qayyim ﷺ He mentions it is لِيُسْعِدَ النَّبِيَّ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Allah took him to the heavens so that he's close to Allah To make the Prophet وسلم, happy And that whole incident It represents how one is in Salah When you're in the Salah That is how close you are to Allah وتعالى. When you're in sujood As the Prophet وسلم, he says The closest the slave is to Allah It is when he's in sujood that's how close you are to Allah Like the Prophet How close he was to Allah When he was in the heavens Right That sujood is where happiness is found That is where contentment is found When I'm feeling grief And I'm feeling sadness I need to flee to salah Because that's precisely what the Prophet He did As we have in the hadith And Nabi إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمَرْ صَلَّى If he ever felt some sort of sadness Or grief or distress He fled to salah and just like that, when he was happy, he went to the salah because the salah is a source of happiness. And that's why I tell people that, wallahi, if you go to sujood and you pour your heart out to Allah, ta'ala, you will feel a level of contentment and happiness that you never felt before because you're directly conversating with Allah. Ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala, he promises you that whatever you ask him for in that sujood, he grants you 100%. It's impossible that you ask Allah for something sujood and Allah won't give it to you. Impossible. Because first of all, you have entered that prayer. You've come to the call of Allah Taala. You responded. You're standing in front of Allah, the most generous of those who who are generous. And Allah Taala, you asked Him in the closest position that you are to Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah Azza wa promised you in the Quran. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أَدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ. Your Lord said, "Call upon me. Allah commanded you. Ask me. I will respond to you 100%." And then in the closest position, you asked Allah and you poured your heart to Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah knows your needs. Allah knows how much you are in dire need. 100% Allah Azza wa Jal give you. Look at this. I mean, look at this situation, right? Just imagine this now. 
the Prophet the Prophet Ali told us and Allah mentioned in the Quran when Adam Ali Salam was created, Allah created Adam and told the angels to prostrate him, go to sujood. Iblis was also there and he was told to go to sujood. Iblis refused. He said, How can I prostrate him? You created me from fire and you created him from clay. I'm better than him. So then what happened? When he refused and he disbelieved, Iblis was expelled by Allah. And when he was expelled by Allah, Iblis, what did he do? He made dua. It's my Lord, allow me to live until the day they resurrect Yom Al-Qiyamah. After Iblis disbelieved and disobeyed Allah, he made that dua. Allah says, Verily, you shall be granted that you'll be allowed to live until Yom Al-Qiyamah. Allah responded and granted Iblis what he wanted, even though he disbelieved and, dis- and disobeyed Allah. So, how can I ever think that I'm worse than Iblis? No believer that believes in Allah, who worships Allah is worse than Iblis, of course. So when I put my face on that ground for Allah, that is the source of happiness and contentment. That's what the Sharia prescribes. But on top of that, the it's, Prophet... It's, it's, not only, it's not only the Salawat al-Maktubah. It's not, not like any the, prayer. It's the, like also the voluntary, voluntary prayer. prayer. The, Prophet the Tahajjud prayer. Yes. Tarawih, as much as you can do. Right? Exactly that. Because the Prophet in the Hadith I mentioned earlier on, that if he ever felt distress, that he prayed, it wasn't an obligatory prayer. Yeah. He just started a voluntary prayer. Immediately he felt that feeling, he started praying. A voluntary prayer. But there's an incident that refers to this exact matter we're talking about, depression. The depression existed in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Was it recognized? Yes, it was. Was something done about it? Was it acknowledged? Was it addressed? Yes, it was. One day, the Prophet ﷺ, he came into the masjid. He saw a sahabi known as Abu Umama, radiallahu anhu, sitting in the masjid by himself. It wasn't a time of salah. So the Prophet ﷺ was intrigued. He asked him, Ya Abu Umama, why are you in the masjid? And it's not the time of salah. Yani. Normally people would be at work, they would be doing stuff. But why are you here? What's brought you here? He asked him. So Abu Umami said, Ya Rasulullah, I have been overwhelmed with debt. And due to that, I'm feeling extreme grief or perhaps depression and anxiety, he said. So the Prophet, والسلام, he sat with him and he comforted him and he consoled him. And then he gave him a prescription. He said to him, Ya Abu Umama, I'll give you a prescription if you do it the way I tell you. Allah will get rid of your debts, He will pay off your debts for you, and get rid of your grief and your depression and your anxiety and so on. So the Abu Umama said, What is it, Ya Rasulullah? He wants to know, right? The Prophet والسلام, he told him every single morning to say this specific dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-bukhli wal-jubun wa-ghalabati al-dayni wa-qahri al-rijal To say, Allahumma ya Allah, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you and your protection from al-hamm. Al-hamm, it is anxiety. Wal-hazan. Al-hazan, it is extreme grief or depression. Wal-ajzi wal-kasal. Al-ajz, it is being incapable or helpless. And kasal is laziness. Wal-bukhli wal-jubun. Al-bukhli, it is miserliness and stinginess or being greedy. Wal-jubun is cowardice. وَغَلَبَتِ الدَّيْنَ Being overwhelmed with debt وَقَهْرِ rijal And being overpowered by other men Now if you notice something here The majority of the things That the Prophet ﷺ taught Abu Umama to say To ask Allah to protect him from They are mental illnesses Anxiety Depression Right uh, Feeling helpless Right Even laziness Which causes what? It's an effect and uh, it's caused by these matters that I mentioned in the end. Being overwhelmed with debt, it causes anxiety. It causes depression. And being overpowered by other men, it makes you feel helpless and it causes cowardice and so on, right? And stinginess, etc. So the Prophet ﷺ taught him to say that every day, without fail. He said, that's the prescription. You have to say it every morning. Abu Umama, he went, he started doing it. A few days later, Abu Umama came back to the Prophet ﷺ, extremely jolly. 
See, Ya Rasulullah, he wants to tell me information. The Prophet Ali sees him and he's thinking, what's the matter, Ya Aba Umama? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I have good news. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has paid off my debts and Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala got rid of my sadness and my grief and my depression and so on by making that dua every day. Dua is an important matter and it's something that sometimes we overlook. We think that it's not the solution to our problems, but sometimes it's a solution to all our problems because our affairs are all in the hands of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. The moment I ask Allah for his help, Allah Jalla fi ula will help you because there's an, a lack of certainty in the dua that people they make sometimes. Some people they make dua with the mentality that I'm just going to give it a go. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, for example, if you look at uh, the very famous dua during Ramadan, Allahumma inna ka'afoon tuhibbu mm-hmm. al-afwa fa'afu anni. You see that a lot of people, they just learn this dua mm-hmm. and they just utter it. That's it. Yeah. They don't like, it's, it's, inna mal a'malu bin niyat. Yes. See, so the deeds, they are based on the intentions. Of course. So when you look at the people, they don't have this intention behind that dua mm-hmm. and they just say what, what you just mentioned. I'm just going to give it a go. I'll see exactly. what the outcome is going to be. I'll if you, try. If you do that, you won't get anything. Because that's extremely disrespectful to Allah. What do I mean by that? Allah, who never breaks a promise, tells you, ask me, I will give you a response. And then you say, I'm going to ask, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get a response. That's extremely disrespectful to Allah. Wa ta'ala. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said, Udu'u Allah wa antum bil ijaba. Call upon Allah. Whilst you are certain 100% that you're going to get a response. But then he also said, Alayhi salatu salam, Inna Allah la yaqbal dua qalbin ghafin lahin. That Allah does not accept the dua of a heart that is absent. You know, sometimes people they make dua and they're just saying words and they don't, it's not coming from their heart. He's just uttering words. They're heedless, they're distracted by other things, they're, folk, they're thinking about other things, they don't mean it. If you make dua like that, Allah won't accept it. Your heart has to be present, your mind has to be present, you have to mean it. Whilst you are certain you're going to get a response. If you make dua like that, Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, when you raise his hands to him, now listen to this, Allah, the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي مِنْ عَبْدِي إِذَا رَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ أَنْ يَرُدَّهُمَا صِفْرًا خَائِبَتَيْنِ Allah is shy. Allah is shy of his slave when he raises his hands to him that Allah returns his hands empty. Who am I that Allah becomes shy of me? It shows the rahmah of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the generosity of Allah that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. It's impossible, almost impossible that Allah, you raise your hands to him that he will not give you what you've asked for. Subhanallah. So this is something the Prophet ﷺ taught him which is a prophetic remedy to this problem. Yeah, it's a prophetic remedy. Now, uh, another thing about we just spoke in the beginning about medical issues, medical disorders, uh, people that have mental issues. So, for example, what I've heard, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, if a person, every every person, re- regardless if he's young, if he's disabled, he's if he's old, if he's mm-hmm. black, white, doesn't matter, has to pray five times. But there are some people that are like. They don't need to pray five times a day. These people are, for example, mentally disabled. They mm-hmm. don't have the capacity to pray. Uh, they're mentally insane. Uh, what do you have to say for people that have mental issues, really severe mental issues? So not, not just the depression, because I think everybody once in their life, they will fall into a depression. Maybe it takes one year, maybe it takes six months, maybe it takes five years. I don't know. Something happens in their lives. They got afflicted, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. But for example, if somebody has a brother or a sister that has a mental mental, mental disorder, what could you say to these people? May Allah wa ta'ala first of all grant all those who are suffering ease and grant them a way out and, and uh, make it a way for them to attain great reward in the hereafter. Amen. And make it expiation for their sins. Amen. But... Um, when the Sharia talks about someone who does not have the mental capacity, right, it means that um, perhaps one may call it insanity, right? That's a term that may, one may use, and I, I use very carefully. Um, but a person not having the mental capacity, the ulama they explain what that means. It is one who is not able to recognize his surroundings. He doesn't. He doesn't know what's going on. He has no idea. He's not able to recognize and understand what's going on around him. 
that person, his marfu'ul qalam, the pen has been lifted from him. As the Prophet ﷺ, he said that there are three types of people that the pen has been lifted from. Amongst them is the one who does not have the mental capacity to comprehend what's going on until he regains that sanity. And amongst them is a child until they reach the age of puberty. And amongst them is the one who's sleeping until they wake up. Nothing is recorded for them. What does that mean? Nothing's recorded for them. No bad deeds or nothing wrong that they do is recorded um, against them. So that individual is the one that's excused. As for someone who's going through a mental disorder or mental difficulty or mental illness, you could say, if that mental illness does not cause this individual to not be to not have the ability to comprehend their surroundings and not actually understand what's going on, then they are not excused and they must perform the acts of worship that they're obliged to do. Unless they get to a stage when they're not able to comprehend what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what I talk about. So the mental illness is not all of them are the same level. There are certain mental illnesses, and I'm no expert to comment on this, but there are certain mental illnesses that I know about that might cause individuals to, that, to get to that level where they don't know what's going on. And there are certain mental illnesses that do not cause that. Um, so it's, it's a matter of, of course, asking the experts and those who know this stuff in detail, because that's what Islam teaches as well. That individual, he asks those who know um, to get the answers and to understand exactly what this is so that a uh, assessment can be made based on that. And also another thing that Islam does recommend and extremely recommends, like we mentioned that one must يعني, help themselves through uh, spiritual matters, but he also teaches us to seek professional help. To seek a professional help is extremely recommended. Islamically, it teaches you to get counsel, to go to someone who can help. And rather, what we're actually taught is that Islamically, you are taught to consult, and not only consult, perhaps sometimes the people need to vent, right? To vent to those who are trustworthy, who are experts, who have the knowledge, who can help you in this field. This is Islamic. This is an Islamic methodology, right? Like therapy, for example. No, it's something that is, is, is encouraged, Islamic. The Prophet ﷺ, in the hadith that I mentioned early on of Abu Umama, the Prophet ﷺ, he sat to Abu Umama and gave him therapy. He gave him therapy. He listened to him, he consoled him, he comforted him. Right, he listened to the problems of, of Abu Umama. That's an Islamic method, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. It's, we're not taught Islamically that you have to bottle everything up and you don't seek help. Like, sometimes you can't do everything by yourself. You need help, right? So Islam teaches you when you can't do it, get help. And Islam, it is a plural religion. It teaches us about to do things together. It doesn't teach us about individualism. That I only think about myself and only care about myself and I try to do everything myself. Like Islam teaches us to do things together, to be concerned about my fellow brother, to love for him what I love myself, to be concerned about his well-being, to help him in the best manner that I can. All these things are Islamic principles. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever relieves his brother from a difficulty in this world, Allah will relieve him from the difficulties of the Yom Whoever conceals the fault of his brother, Allah will conceal his faults on the Day of Judgment in this world and the hereafter. And so on, right? These are Islamic principles that we're taught to help others, to assist them. So because we're taught to help others, that means that we should also seek help when we need it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's common in the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sahaba, when they needed help, they sought it. I have a quote. It's a quote that I think Abu Taymiyyah last time when he was here uh, spoke about. It was a quote from a non-Muslim. Uh, his name is Jim Carrey. He's a multi-millionaire. And he said, uh, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Mm -hmm. So this is a non-Muslim saying this. Uh, so how come that people who have everything in this world are still empty inside? Because the heart, the heart is where true happiness lies. And the heart does not attain happiness through materialistic things. Rather, the heart was created by Allah. And Allah knows what gives that heart happiness. And Allah Ta'ala told us in the Quran exactly and precisely what that is. He says, Those who believe. And their hearts 
find rest in the remembrance of Allah. Verily, the remembrance of Allah and the worship of Allah and the obedience of Allah, hearts find tranquility and happiness and contentment and the rest that they're looking for. Allah created these hearts and Allah knows where what these hearts, what they need. Therefore, these other matters, Allah he tells us, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضْ Or before that, فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَى وَمَنْ أَعْرَضْ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكًا وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا قال كذلك أتتك آياتنا فنسيتها وكذلك اليوم تنسى Allah says, whoever follows my guidance فمن اتبع هداية As for the one who follows my guidance He follows the religion of Allah He follows the obedience of Allah He stays away from the disobedience of Allah تبارك وتعالى فلا يضل ولا يشقى He shall never be misguided and he will never be one who is miserable. Meaning the opposite is what he's going to attain, happiness. And then Allah says, and as for the one who turns away from my religion, my remembrance, my guidance, he shall have a difficult, miserable, depressed life. Does it stop there? No. It extends to the hereafter. You have a depressed life in this world and the hereafter even more depressing. وَنَحْشُرُهُ Allah says we shall resurrect him on the day of judgment blind He will say my Lord Why have you resurrected me blind when I used to have sight in this dunya? And he will be said to him كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتٌ Like that our verses came to you Our signs came to you فَنَسِيتَهَا And you turned away from it وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى And just like that today you shall be abandoned Imagine that day that you need Allah the most Allah says to you You shall be abandoned أَيَاذَ بِاللَّهِ So that is what Allah tells us that it's not found in these matters. Rather, the worldly matters and this dunya is a bridge for the hereafter. You take from the dunya that which you need for the hereafter, even if you have a lot. The Sahaba amongst them were those who are multi-millionaires in, yani in modern terms. They had everything amongst the ten who were promised paradise were those who were very wealthy. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was very wealthy. Uthman bin Affan was very wealthy. Abdul Rahman bin Auf was very wealthy. Seven of the ten that are promised paradise were successful businessmen who had a lot of wealth, but that they were not attached to that wealth. The problem is attachment to the dunya. When one is attached to the dunya and they're clinging onto it and they completely neglect the hereafter, that's when they become depressed. And they don't feel any contentment. But these Sahaba who had perhaps everything, what were they doing? They were using that wealth to please Allah. When the Prophet ﷺ, he said, whoever contributes to Jaish al-Usra, whoever contributes to it, they have Jannah. Uthman radiallahu anhu, he sponsored all the transport that the Sahaba, they were using their weapons. 30,000 men. He sponsored it, he paid for it. Radiallahu anhu. Abd Rahman Ma'awf, he brought a lot of wealth. Abu Bakr brought all of his wealth. Umar brought half his wealth. Right? Why? Because the they were told they're going to get Jannah. This is nothing to get to Jannah. I have it, I'm going to give it for Jannah. Umar, he brought half his wealth. And the Prophet said to him, What have you, what have you left your family? He said, I left the other half of my wealth. Then Abu Bakr, Umar today, he thought this is the day that he used to compete with Abu Bakr, right? So he thought, today is the day I'm going to beat him. I brought half my wealth. It's impossible Abu Bakr is going to bring half. Right? <laughs> That's what he thought to himself. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes with all of his wealth. Umar is shocked. Surprised. The Prophet alayhi said to Abu Bakr, Ya Abu Bakr, Mada abqayta li ahlik? What have you left for your family? He said, look at the answer. Abqaytu lahum Allah wa rasulah. I have left to them Allah and his messenger alayhi salam. What does he mean by that? And I have full reliance upon Allah Taala that Allah Taala to provide for me, and I have full belief in the statement of the Prophet that Allah will provide for me when I give charity and what He told me that I'm going to get more in return. And He was a businessman; He knew that He reliance upon Allah doesn't mean that I say, "Inshallah, Allah provides me," and I don't do anything. I have the ability to get this money back, right? 
he had successful businesses that were running. Tawakkul ala Allah, reliance upon Allah. He came with a means of putting his trust in Allah and doing what he can. Right? So these individuals, they use this wealth as a bridge to get to Jannah. So the important fact it is that no matter what you possess, it's not in your heart, it's just in your hands. You have it in your hands, and just like it came into your hands, it goes out. Because you're going to leave this world with nothing. And like the poet, he would say, في كل يوم لنا ميت نشيعه نرى بمصرعه آثار موتانا يا نفس مالي وللأموال أتركها خلفي وأخرج من دنيا عريانا He said every day في كل يوم لنا ميت We have a dead person that we are carrying to their grave by seeing his death and his funeral and so on, it reminds us of those who previously before him passed away. Ya nafsu oh my soul. Mali amwali What is it with me and this attachment that I have to his wealth? That I'm going to leave Khalfi behind me. I'm going to be taken out of his world naked. With nothing. I'm just going to be in one shroud with absolutely nothing. None of that wealth is going to go to that grave with you. So that's why they understood that and they had that mindset. They lived by the statement of Allah Taala. Allah says, وَبَتَغِي Seek that which Allah has granted you from the world the hereafter. That should be your goal. Focus on that. Tell on vision. And then look what Allah says. Look, the wording of the Qur'an is precise. Nothing is by chance. Allah says, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Do not forget your portion of dunya. If I said to you every day, Ya Samir, don't forget to do this, don't forget to do this, don't forget to do this. What does this show? It shows that this matter I keep reminding you of, it's not of your priority. Right? So Allah says, do not forget your portion of dunya, meaning that that's not priority. The priority is the akhirah. So take from the dunya that what you need to serve your akhirah. Right? Yeah. That's the mentality. Uh, subhanAllah, if you, if you look, Allah give, gives this provision to the companions, and the companions actually give it back in the way of Allah. No. And Allah gives much more. SubhanAllah. And it's like a tijara with it's Allah. Tijara, and that's exactly how they saw it. They saw it as tijara. With Allah and Allah calls it tijara, lentabur that will never perish because it extends to the hereafter. You're going to get the profits of that tijara, that transaction with Allah in the hereafter. Therefore, they invested in Allah. He said, In man Allah qardan hasana, who's going to give Allah a goodly loan when referring to charity? There was a Sahabi, his name was Abu Dahdah, radiallahu anhu. He heard this ayah from the Prophet. Alayhi salatu who is going to give Allah a goodly loan so that Allah can multiply for him many, many multiples? Abu Dahdah, he said, Ya Rasulullah, does Allah want us to give him a loan? That's what he said. So the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. So he said, he said, give me your hand, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ put his hand out. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I possess the most expensive farm in all of Medina. I loan this farm to Allah. This is his source of income, his provision. What happens? He gives it for Allah. The Prophet ﷺ says, very well. Now, <laughs> what happens? He goes home. His wife and his children are in the farm. He stands outside the farm and he shouts, Ya Um Dahdah! Ya Um Dahdah! She says, yes, what's the matter? He says, I have loaned this farm to Allah Taala. Collect your belongings and take your children and come out. If I went home now and I said that to my wife, she would kill me. That I gave everything away. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is gone, khalas, in charity. The house is gone, the car is gone, everything gone. Well, she'll say to me, have you lost your mind? She'll say to me, right? But look how this righteous woman, she responded. She said, your transaction is profitable, ya Abu Dahdah. That's, a, that's the exact response she gave straight away. And then Abu Dahdah, radiallahu anhu, it is said that after he did that, Allah ta'ala gave him an even better farm. That was worth more. That's those who have certainty in the promise of Allah who give for the sake of Allah, they get more in return. 
more than you can ever anticipate, expect. That is how they dealt with Allah Taala. That's how they lived with Allah Taala with certainty, with full reliance upon Allah Taala. What I have in the first place, Allah gave it to me. Allah can give me a lot more. So why am I stressed? Why am I worried? Why am I concerned? Whoever relies upon Allah, Allah shall suffice him. That's how they lived. Now, last thing I want to discuss, inshallah, it's about the youngsters because the youngsters they are going to be the future generation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the youngsters, especially in the West, you see that depression is something that is present, but also it's also linked to identity problems. They live in the West. They have their own culture, uh, cultural norms, uh, standards. Uh, they are Muslim, uh, but they also live in the West. And you see, of course, the atheist perspectives and all the other isms, as mm. I just mentioned, liberalism, feminism, all those mm. isms. Uh, the thing is that isms. I want to know, <laughs> the thing is that I want to know is what advice would you give to the youngsters, especially with identity problems uh, to deal with? Like a good nasiha. La ilaha illallah. We live in a time where these isms are spreading everywhere like wildfire. They are polluting the minds of the Muslims. They are infiltrating into the homes. They are destroying the hearts and the minds of the Muslims, the young, the old, everyone. And the greatest way to combat these matters, because these matters of all these isms, they go back to two matters, two main matters. Shubhat, shahawat. They go back to doubts and misconceptions and Shahawat desires and evil desires. That's where they come from. That's where they stand from. These two matters, the Sharia has taught us how to tackle them, how to correct them, how to remedy, the, uh, remedy them. As for the first, which is the misconceptions and the doubts, is tackled with knowledge. The more knowledge you gain regarding your faith, regarding your deen, Islam, seeking sacred knowledge is something that every single Muslim should be doing. To a certain extent, because it's not befitting for the Muslim to be ignorant, especially when it comes to your own faith. Because we are in a time where it's even more important to learn about your faith because our faith is being targeted, is being attacked, it's being distorted. Forget that our nature as human beings is being targeted. The family, the families are being targeted, the way our families are structured are being targeted, and they are a threat, right? Therefore, with knowledge we can combat that. We can correct it because the more knowledge you have, Allah Taala first of all will safeguard your faith for you. Allah will protect your faith for you, your Islam for you. Insha Allah Taala. And secondly, you can expel these doubts with the knowledge that you have. No one can make you doubt your faith. And then as for the second matter, which is the desires, desires is combated with righteous deeds, being in righteous comp uh, company, being in righteous places, abstaining and refraining from the places of evil, not going to those places, changing your circle of friends that. To those who are righteous and who encourage you to do good deeds, etc., to protect yourself, you go into the calf of the people of the cave. The people of the cave, when they went into the calf, what were they fleeing from? They were fleeing from these two matters. They were fleeing from these matters that are their people were engaging in in terms of worshiping other than Allah, committing shirk, associate partners with Allah, committing evil desires, etc. These young men, they fled from that and they sought refuge in a cave. Yeah. How many years were they sleeping? They were sleeping for huh, 309 years. It's not a short time. <laughs> but Allah, wa ta He protected them from all that time. He protected and safeguarded them. In this surah, surah al-Kahf, one thing that stands out is, is that every Friday we recite it, isn't it? Surah al-Kahf, every Friday we recite it. Have you ever asked yourself why? For some people I tell them, have you ever asked yourself why? That at least once a week you're reciting Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf, it mentions all the trials and difficulties that we face on a daily basis. And it tells you the solution to it. Allah mentions Surah Al-Kahf, the fitna of deen, the trial of religion being tested in your faith, that your faith is in danger. Like in the story of the people of the cave, they fled to protect themselves. So what's should I do when I am faced with the same issue that I flee from the place of fitna to safeguard my deen because my deen is the most precious thing that I possess mm -hmm. without Islam I'm nothing without Iman I'm nothing therefore I safeguard the most valuable thing that I possess which is my faith yeah, and that's going to also let... that's going to also safeguard your identity exactly as well. your identity and keep you away from depression 100% 100% yeah. so these young men they did that 
They sacrifice their livelihoods. Imagine, they're young men. They have their whole lives ahead of them. They're Ushra Shabab, youth. They have their whole lives ahead of them. But they recognize that this religion that I have, that I have been blessed with, I must protect it. So 309 years, they, they were away. From all of that, that's a huge sacrifice. But in order for one to be successful, they have to make a level of sacrifice. And the Prophet ﷺ teaches us, من ترك شيئاً لله عوضه الله خيرا منه When you sacrifice something for Allah, you're never at loss. Whoever sacrifices and leaves something for Allah, Allah grants him something better than it. 100%. It's a promise of Allah. In this world and the next, Allah will grant you better. So in Surah Al-Kahf, we have the fitna of deen. We also have the fitna of companionship. Allah Ta'ala mentions. Before I tell you the verses, Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Kahf, these verses were revealed due to Quraysh, the leaders of Quraysh. They came to the Prophet And they were disbelievers at the time. Like Abu Sufyan, Al-Aqra ibn Habis, Uyayr ibn Hisun, etc. These leaders and chiefs of Quraysh, they came to the Prophet and they said to him, Ya Muhammad, if you made special gatherings for us, that you address us, and perhaps convey your religion to us, perhaps we will listen to you if you leave your companions like Bilal ibn Rabah and Ammar ibn Yasir and Suhaib ibn Rumi, these companions who are non-Arabs that they considered insignificant and they looked down upon, right? They discriminated against them. They said, if you make special gatherings for us, that's only for us elite people, then maybe we'll listen to what you have to say. So then Allah revealed in response to that, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطًا Allah says, وَاسْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ Be patient, O Muhammad In the company of those who call upon their Lord day and night, they're seeking the pleasure of Allah, they're seeking the face of Allah. And do not turn away from them. Are you seeking the adornments of this life? And do not obey those who their hearts have been made heedless from our remembrance. And they follow their desires, right? So that is being said to the Prophet ﷺ, who is the best of creation. What about me and you? Of course, I need to be patient with the company of the righteous, right? So Allah Ta'ala, He addresses the fitna of companionship here. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah also addresses the fitna of wealth with the story of the man who possessed the gardens, right? Who he said, وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ قَالَ مَا أَظُنُّ أَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدًا وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمًا He entered his garden and when he looked at it, he said, I don't think this will ever perish. And I don't think that the hour is going to be established. He disbelieved in Yawm al everything due to this blessing that Allah has granted him, this wealth that Allah has granted him. So Allah he addresses that, that one is meant to be grateful to Allah, not ungrateful. It doesn't cause him to be arrogant. It doesn't cause him to disbelieve. Rather, he gives these matters for the sake of Allah. It's Allah who bestowed this upon you in the first place and so on. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah addresses the fitna of knowledge in the story of Musa and Khidr. Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. Where Musa in the Hadith Sahih Bukhari, where Musa alayhi salam was asked, because in, in the Hadith, Musa alayhi salam, what he did was he delivered a sermon to Bani Israel. He delivered a lecture to them, you can say. And this lecture, it made them very emotional. To the extent that people, they became very emotional, they started crying, right? So because of how impressed they were by how he spoke and what he said, he was asked, is there anyone who, he was asked, who is the most knowledgeable, ya Musa? And then Musa alayhi salam, he said, I am. To be honest, he said that on the basis that he's the messenger of Allah. He's a prophet of Allah, a messenger of Allah. He's receiving revelation. So he assumed I'm the most knowledgeable because Allah has given me revelation. But by him saying that, it was incorrect. What he was meant to say was Allah knows the best, right? Allah knows best. There could be someone more knowledgeable than me. So then 
Allah tabarak wa ta'ala informed Musa alayhi salam, Ya Musa, there is someone on the face of the earth who is more knowledgeable than you in Majma' al-Bahrain, where the two seas meet. So travel to him and seek that knowledge from him. Musa alayhi salam, who is a messenger of Allah, prophet of Allah, he traveled all that distance to go seek that knowledge from that man who knows more than him. What does this teach us? That knowledge should not cause you to have arrogance. Rather, it should keep you humble. Musa, he goes to Khidr. Khidr is different upon the scholars. They differ. Is he a prophet or is he a righteous man, a, a, a wali of Allah, etc.? Regardless, whether if you say he's a prophet or you say he's a wali of Allah, Musa is always every, in every situation better than him. Because Musa, if you say that Khidr is, is, a, is a prophet of Allah, right? Musa is a prophet of Allah and a messenger of Allah and he's from Ul Azm, the five best prophets. Right? So in any situation, Musa is better than him. What does Musa say? قَالَ هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتَ رُشْدَىٰ Look at the statement. He says to him, if you come to a teacher, and you, said to, you say to the teacher, for instance, can you teach, uh, I want you to teach me. I want you to teach me. Right? The teacher may say to you, I don't want to teach you. He, maybe he, he might not want to teach you. Right? Because of the way you pose the question, I want you to teach me as if you're demanding. Yeah. Teach me, right? But Musa alayhi salam, look at the etiquette, look at the adab. He said, he's a prophet of Allah. He's better than Khidr, without a doubt. But he's showing us that how you should be humble when it comes to someone who you're seeking knowledge from. Can I follow you? I, he says to him, Hal Will you allow me to follow you so that you can teach me some of that which you have been taught from guidance? And emphasis on the word some of that. Some of that, it shows etiquette. That Musa is not saying teach me everything you know. Because when you say to a teacher that teach me everything you know, it's maybe you're just trying to get above him straight away. Yani. Some teachers might find that way. Wait, where's this guy trying to go, right? Some of that what you know. That's what I want. Showing humility. So he accompanies Khadr and Khadr. He sees all the different matters that's happening and Musa is taught that this is a lesson for you, even though you receive revelation, there's someone who possesses more knowledge than you. And then the last matter that Allah wa ta'ala mentions, it is the fitna of authority or being a position of power with the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Having authority and how you should deal with it. These matters are all fitna that people they face. So Surah Al-Kahf is a surah, when you read it with reflection and understanding it, it gives you a solution to all these problems. It will be that cave like it was for the cave of the young men who sought refuge in that cave. right? So we need to gain that knowledge to protect ourselves, safeguard ourselves, and to be those who are close to Allah and safeguard their identity. And that's through knowledge. Through knowledge and being around the righteous. Being around the righteous. Like the poet who say, تَشَبَّهُ بِالْكِرَامِ إِنْ لَمْ تَكُونُوا مِثْلَهُمْ إِنَّ تَشَبُّهَ بِالْكِرَامِ فَلَاحُ He would say that make yourself look like the righteous and the honorable people if you can't be like them. Because just like just by imitating them and looking like them, and that is success. Just by imitating them and looking like them, that is success itself. Right? That's how the people before us, that's how they viewed it. Yeah. Okay, I think we wrapped it up. We spoke from different angles. Uh, mm -hmm. We have enough information, inshallah, to tackle yeah, inshallah, depression, inshallah. to prevent it, yeah. and know how to deal with it, inshallah. May Allah make it beneficial, Ya Rab. Ameen, Ameen. Jazakallah khairan for your... Jazakallah uh, khair for inviting me, for having me here. It's a pleasure and it's... Love to see your great platform and the great work that you're doing. May Allah put barak in your work I mean, and I mean. accept it from you all. And may Allah make it heavy on skills, your al qiyamah. And uh, may Allah take you from success to success, inshallah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. I, mean, I, mean, ya Rab. I really commend your work. Jazakallah khair. I would like to finish off with a recitation of you. Recitation of the Quran? طيب. Inshallah. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد آتيناك سبعا من المثاني والقرآن العظيم لا تمدن عينيك إلى ما متعنا به أزواجا منهم ولا تحزن عليهم ولا تحزن عليهم واخفض جناحك للمؤمنين وقل 
المقتسمين الذين جعل الذين جعلوا القرآن عضين فوربك لنسألنهم أجمعين عما كانوا يعملون فاصدع بما تؤمر وأعرض عن المشركين إنا كفيناك المستهزين الذين يجعلون مع الله إلهنا خر الذين يجعلون مع الله إلها آخر فسوف يعلمون ولقد نعلم أنك يضيق صدرك بما يقولون ولقد نعلم أنك يضيق صدرك بما يقولون فسبح بحمد ربك وكن من الساجدين واعبد ربك حتى يأتيك اليقين جزاكم الله خيرا دا أعوذ برواية خلفا حمزة yeah. Those who might be confused يعني what Quran is this الله يبارك فيكم بارك الله فيك استاذ سو غنا ان ذس بودكاست ديير فيوز براذرز اند سيسترز ثانك يو كيب شيرينغ ذس بودكاست اس ماتش اس بوسيبل اند ويل سي يو ذا نيكست تايم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله